Cluster B personality disorders are characterized by dramatic, overly emotional, and unpredictable thoughts and behavior. From Ars Longa Media, this is Cluster B, scientifically informed, expert insights into the four Cluster B personality types, antisocial, borderline, narcissistic, and histrionic personality disorder. Here's today's host, Dr. Todd Grande. This is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks, can a person with borderline personality disorder, BPD, truly love other people? Now, I've heard this question a few times, and mostly the type of relationships that the questions are talking about are romantic. Another related question here is, can a person with BPD actually love themselves? So the technical answer really to both these questions, of course, is yes. But here I'll be looking at the tendencies with a specific type of love. How do people with BPD tend to behave? So as I answer this question, first I'll be taking a look at the definition of BPD and of love, how we can define love in a manner where we can talk about it in a meaningful way. Then I'll look at the different types of love, and inside of each type, I'll talk about the relationship between that type of love and a person with borderline personality disorder. So to define BPD, we know that this disorder is a cluster B personality disorder in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM. So it's in the same cluster as antisocial, narcissistic, and histrionic personality disorders. We see nine symptom criteria with this disorder. Frantic efforts to avoid abandonment, unstable relationship patterns, sometimes called the love-hate cycle, a tendency to idealize and then devalue a romantic partner, typically. We see identity disturbance, so difficulty with self-image, impulsivity in at least two areas that can be self-damaging, suicidal behavior, affective instability, like having trouble regulating emotions, having a chronic feeling of emptiness, inappropriate or intense anger or difficulty controlling anger, and paranoid ideation or severe dissociation. Now, interestingly with BPD, comorbid psychopathology actually explains a lot of dysfunction in romantic relationships. So what this means is the disorders that tend to co-occur with BPD might actually explain why people with BPD tend to have so much trouble in romantic relationships. So not necessarily the symptoms of the disorder, but the comorbidity. So again, kind of an interesting finding we see in the research literature. So in the case of BPD, we can't really just discount comorbidity. With this disorder, we'd actually expect to see comorbidity more often than not. And really, the common comorbidity would be other personality disorders, especially in the same cluster, but also disorders like major depressive disorder or anxiety disorders like generalized anxiety disorder. So now moving on to the definition of love. This is fairly complex because love can actually be thought of as related to a number of fields. It has a theological definition, a philosophical definition, and we know that science is part of philosophy, so it also has a scientific definition. And that's the one I'm going to be using here in this video, looking at love and trying to capture it in a scientific way. To do that, I'll be using what's called the triangular theory of love. This is a fairly popular, but of course somewhat controversial way of understanding what love is and what the types of love are. So with this model, love has three variables, intimacy, passion, and commitment. So intimacy is when you have a relationship where there's a feeling of closeness and connectedness. Passion represents a drive that leads to romance, physical attraction, and sexual activity. Commitment, also called decision, in the short term involves the decision that one loves another person, and in the long term, commitment involves the decision to maintain that love, to stay in that relationship in a loving way. Only one of these factors has to be present for some type of love to be in a relationship, and of course, there are different combinations of these three factors that also point to certain types of love. So now looking at the types of love. The first one I'm going to mention here is only intimacy. So this one is a type of love where we only see intimacy, no passion or no commitment. This type of love is called liking. Now this may seem kind of odd because usually we think of liking and loving as different. But here in this model, if you like somebody, you also love them, at least in this one way, in the way of intimacy the way of feeling close. One of the most popular methods for determining if somebody likes somebody else in this way is if two people are friends and one leaves. So two people are close to one another, one leaves, and one of the individuals has 
feelings and thoughts of loss, but they don't really obsess about it. They don't ruminate. They're not preoccupied with the fact that that person left, right? So it's more cognition than it is feeling. So if there's more than that, if there's a preoccupation, that would point toward another type of love, some other type of love, not the liking type of love. So with liking, somebody is passively missed, not actively missed. So can somebody with BPD have this type of love? Yes, but I don't think it's actually fairly common. Often in clinical practice, when we see people with BPD, we see that intimate relationships more or less go in one direction or the other. So they don't really stay at the intimacy stage. They move to add passion, to add commitment, or to add both. One could argue that this type of love, liking, collapses under the weight of other BPD symptoms, like anger, unstable relationships, and affective instability. These same symptoms could also result in the passion component being added, which would convert this liking to romantic love, which I'll cover in a moment. The fear of abandonment and subsequent frantic efforts to avoid abandonment can be triggered by intimacy alone. And this can happen even in a relationship that fails to manifest a clear potential to lead to romance. So two people can be friends, they can be intimate at that level, they can be at the liking stage, and the individual with borderline personality disorder may start to think that the relationship can be more. If there's any type of attraction, there's going to be, again, a push toward passion and even a push toward intimacy. Now, this liking, of course, is only intimacy. What if we have only passion? This is called infatuated love. It's intoxicating, irrational, usually short-lived, associated with terrible decision-making, and obvious to the person who's experiencing it. Typically, the person who's experiencing it knows it's happening, but it's extremely obvious to other people watching that person. It can lead to both intimacy and commitment, and many romantic relationships actually start with infatuated love. So how about BPD and infatuated love? I would say that this type of love with BPD is fairly common. Infatuated love is highly consistent with emotional highs and lows, affective instability. People with BPD often fall hard for a potential romantic partner, which typically means an extreme manifestation of infatuated love. Borderline traits are consistent with bringing a certain degree of intensity to relationships, and this intensity can be thought of as infatuated love, at least some of the time. Infatuated love tends to satisfy the feelings of emptiness we see with BPD, even though this type of love is often empty itself. This type of love can help somebody establish identity because people often identify based on a relationship they have. So this would really speak to the identity disturbance symptom criterion of BPD. So I covered only intimacy and only passion. What if somebody has only commitment? Well, this is called empty love. For example, an arranged marriage. The commitment is made first, and maybe we see intimacy and passion appear later. Maybe we don't. Also, a relationship could start out with more than just commitment and lose the other factors and be left just with commitment in the end. So the relationship could become stagnant, and that's why we think of empty love as the most fragile type of love. So does empty love appear a lot with BPD? I would say no. It's not particularly common with BPD. This type of love doesn't have anything of interest for a person with BPD. They want intimacy and passion, and this type of love has neither. The unstable relationship pattern, the frantic efforts to avoid abandonment, the impulsivity, all these things test a romantic relationship. They strain a loving relationship. And because empty love is so fragile, it would cave into the strain fairly quickly. So this type of love either wouldn't occur or it would fall apart fairly soon after it occurred. Now, in the case where a person with BPD has commitment, passion, intimacy, and passion and intimacy dissipate, we're still kind of in the same situation. They're left with empty love, and the relationship would fail usually quickly. BPD is ultimately a disorder of disturbed attachment, and this attachment can change and often does change fairly rapidly. Now, the next type of love is companionate love. And this is when a couple develops intimacy and commitment, but they lose the passion or they never had the passion in the first place. This is actually fairly common. The spark is gone from the relationship, but the couple is still close and they want to stay together. Does this happen with BPD? I think this certainly happens some of the time, but like some of the other types of love, I don't think this is usually maintained for a long period of time. So there's a few reasons here. 
One reason, the commitment part disintegrates as part of that love-hate cycle. So when somebody's in that devaluation phase, that's going to move this companionate love to the side. It's going to break apart this type of love. The second reason is the passion part might come back. With the passion component being absent, as is the case with companionate love, this only increases paranoia, anger, emptiness, emotional dysregulation, the frantic efforts to avoid abandonment, and the impulsivity. The relationship doesn't feel real to the person with BPD. The passion part is really a defining element of the experience. So again, they're going to work to get that back. The next type of love is romantic love. And this is when a couple has intimacy and passion, but no commitment. So there's no decision made here to commit to the relationship. Nobody knows what's going to happen. It's just kind of moment by moment. Some would argue that romantic love is really the same as infatuated love. I view them as different. So do we see this with BPD? I would say frequently we do, but briefly, because the individual BPD is typically going to want that commitment. There is a pressure for that early in the relationship. Somebody with this disorder is not going to want to have that uncertainty of intimacy and passion in the absence of commitment. It's going to seem like something's missing, a feeling of emptiness, a fear of abandonment. The direction of the relationship isn't clear, but the future of the relationship is important to somebody with BPD, which of course is understandable. It's not just the here and now, not just the closeness and the intense feelings. It is what's going to happen down the road. Is the couple still going to be together? Now, one thing I've seen here sometimes is the partner of the person with BPD figures out that the commitment piece is extremely important, and they may use this to manipulate the person with BPD. So the partner won't commit, or they only provide a weak level of commitment in an effort to control the relationship. And this manipulation can be fairly effective, stringing the person with BPD along for months, if not years, with the promise of a future commitment. Moving on to the next type of love we have here, fatuous love. Fatuous love is when passion leads to commitment, but not intimacy. Now, theoretically, commitment could lead to passion. That happens sometimes. But usually we think of passion as happening first. This type of love is characterized by the quick establishment of a long-term relationship, like if a couple gets married quickly. There's no true understanding, no closeness, no real connectedness, but there's a lot of passion and energy and at least a tenuous commitment. We see this all the time with like celebrities, for example. We see stories of a couple that meets on Monday, they're engaged on Tuesday, and married on Saturday. Now that may be a little bit of an exaggeration, but that's kind of what we see, kind of a quick progression to the commitment. Now the failure rate for these type of relationships is extremely high. And this type of relationship is actually extremely common with individuals who have BPD. Essentially what we see here is the individual with BPD and often the partner believe that the intimacy is really there because they think the passion also takes care of the intimacy. But of course the intimacy is not there. It's fatuous love. So they believe essentially that they have complete love, which I'll get to in a moment. The extremely high level of passion can temporarily compensate for and imitate intimacy. The poor judgment associated with high levels of passion leads to the poor decision to make a long-term commitment. The idealization phase is also key to fatuous love. It facilitates both passion and commitment. So moving to the last type of love I'll cover here, it's called complete love or consummate love. And this is when you have intimacy, passion, and commitment all together at the same time. This is what many people think of when they think of the perfect romantic love. And individuals with BPD feel the same way. They want connectedness, the intensity and the excitement, and the commitment of a long-term relationship. Again, this is completely understandable. Now with BPD, achieving this type of love certainly occurs with some regularity because individuals with this disorder are prone to offer or demand all three variables of love quite quickly. But maintaining this type of love can be difficult. So many of the symptoms of BPD can affect one or more of these factors. And again, all three factors have to be present to see consummate or complete love. The fear of abandonment reduces intimacy. It can also reduce passion. The feeling of emptiness can make a person feel that the intimacy is not really there, even if it is. The devaluation phase of the love-hate cycle can destroy all three of these factors. Inappropriate or intense anger can destroy all three factors as well. And I think identity disturbance can play a key role here. 
when somebody's in a loving relationship that rises to the level of consummate love, part of their identity is in that relationship. There's an investment in the relationship at an identity level. The individual with BPD struggles with self-image, and that distortion of how they view themselves extends to a distortion of how they view that relationship. Their appraisal of the quality of the relationship will be as unsteady as their self-appraisal. So overall, looking at BPD and consummate love, essentially there's an inability here to feel comfortable and secure in a relationship, which in large part is defined by stability. Something so good, something perfect, something ideal must be at risk. It must require more effort to maintain. There's no sitting back. There's no resting. There's no point where success can be accomplished. Again, at least in the mind of somebody with borderline traits. There is no believing at a really deep down level that one can be or that one deserves to be loved this completely, which makes it very easy to answer the second question I mentioned at the beginning of the video. Can somebody with borderline personality disorder really love themselves? When we talk about self-love, we're really not talking about something that can be covered by the triangular theory of love. This theory is only appropriate when you have two people involved. Self-love is usually thought of something like self-esteem. Does somebody think well of themselves? Do they think they're worthy? Do they believe that they are good enough to be loved by others? In a sense, are they secure with who they are, with their own identity? With this being the understanding of self-love, the answer would be no, or at least it would be a great challenge. And perhaps this is a key part of borderline personality disorder. For more content like this, check out Healthy Toxic, another podcast from Ars Longa Media, all about what makes or breaks relationships, including issues related to narcissism, narcissistic abuse, and how personality disorders affect relationships. Ars Longa, Vita Brevis. Learn more at arslonga.media.